All right, everyone, um, let's begin. Thank you so much for, uh, for joining us today with um, Professor Santiago Slabotsky and uh, Professor Sanuba Rumar. Um, I'm not going to introduce them because I've, um, I've asked them to introduce themselves and, um, and situate themselves in relation to their own uh, trajectories and their own work. I think that's gonna be more interesting than me uh, reading their uh, relatively uh, concise bios from the faculty web pages of their universities. Um, before we begin, um, I'm just going to say a few words about the um, format today. So we're going to be having uh, four parts, essentially. Uh, right after this, Alessandra uh, Benedicti uh, Koken is going to be um, giving a, uh, an introduction to uh, this topic of um, Islam, Judaism, and uh, decoloniality um, from her uh, perspective. And then we'll move right into uh, the presentations by uh, Professor Slavotsky and, um, and Professor Umar. Um, that will probably take around 30 minutes in total, after which the two of them will uh, respond to each other. Finally, we'll open um, the discussion um, to the uh, audience um, for a broader conversation around these uh, themes. So at that point, you'll find the uh, chat function uh, available to use. Right now, it's, uh, it's not available to use. Um, and uh, at that point, you can also, if, you, if you'd rather ask your question um, orally, you can uh, raise your hand using the uh, raised hand function, and then we'll um, unmute you. All right, um, without further ado, um, Alessandra. Um, it's a very short introduction and I'll get straight started. Thank you, Adi. I begin with an anecdote from the Critical Muslim Studies Summer School in Granada in 2019, when I first heard Professor Slabotsky speak. Each professor in the program lectured between two or four days and for three to four hours at a time. After uh, one of Professor Slabotsky's lectures, a friend I had made at the summer school, but who was sitting far from me in the room, who self-identified as Jewish, could not withhold her tears. In just a few hours, Professor Slabotsky's readings and words had destabilized, but also transformed her entire ethical framework. Namely, her narrative of what Michael Rothberg describes as the often limiting binary of who is victim and who is perpetrator. Within seconds, four or five of our other summer school classmates gathered around our friend comforting her. And my, I need to add that they were self-identifying as Muslim. And for the rest of the week accompanied her in her inquiries and in her affect in her awakening to how the narrative she had grown up with, while in some sense true, did not represent the entire story. But what had Professor Slabotsky done and how did he achieve it so quickly? I have been reminded of this moment in June 2019, yes, because I was preparing my opening remarks for today, but also because I spent the weekend watching Raul Peck's four episode, Exterminate All the Brutes, released last week. And based on his intellectual friendships with the late Sven Lindquist, the late Michel Holf Trujillo, and Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz. There are similarities between Professor Slabotsky and Peck's work. The second chapter of Professor Slabotsky's Decolonial Judaism, Triumphal Failures of Barbaric Thinking is titled The Narrative of Barbarism, Western Designs for a Globalized North, with the word barbaric repeated twice, like Peck's use of the word brutes, not as alarmist, but as a critical category of analysis that we must take seriously. We might also here add one of Mbembe's most recent books, Brutalisme. As I reread Professor Slabotsky for today, as I listen and watch Peck narrate his most recent documentary, as I come enthusiastically into contact with Sanobert Umar's work, and as I find myself among the caring and rigorous intellectual space that Adi, Flora, and Catherine create, I am struck by the meticulous intentionality, yes, the meticulous intentionality of what seasoned decolonial work looks like. It has perhaps a few steps, and here I speak from the perspective of whiteness, a Jewish whiteness, but a whiteness that in most of the spaces I circulate affords me privileges. A Jewishness which constantly reminds me how precarious such privilege can be, 
and a decolonial ethos, which asks that I not proceed from fear. I repeat, I not proceed from fear, the fear of becoming irrelevant, which is how Lewis R. Gordon characterizes whiteness and white supremacy. In other words, what Professor Slabotsky's work asked us to do in those days, in June 2019 in Granada, were to proceed from two spaces that may often seem at odds with each other, caring for each other within contexts of such barbarism and brutality, and doing the right thing now, which was a constantly repeated phrase at the critical Muslim studies summer school when I first heard Professor Slabotsky speak. What then I see in Slabotsky, Peck, my boss Wayne Modest, as well as the motivating and inspiring work of Adi, Flora, and Catherine, who run this research network, are the above, but also two further gestures, which are inviting those of us who are innocent or ignorant to learn more, forgiving us for not having until now known, and yet at the same time, almost immediately inviting us no, not just inviting us, demanding of us that we be accountable for the silence past we have had pretended or we have had had no clue about. And finally, and I think this is the, the, the season part of decolonial work, asking us to care for each other through and because of rig rigorous retelling of imperialist, brutal and barbaric narratives, which make even those with pasts of victimization, such as myself, privy to their violences and becoming aware that any focus on those who suffer most now has to do with caring for an ethical commitment to all lives that matter. We do not lose or become irrelevant by caring for others, we only gain. And so I end my acknowledgement. I thank and honor your scholarship and your presence. In Haitian Creole, direct addresses are often ended with the salutation, l'honne à crespé. Honor and respect, Professor Slabodsky. Thank you for being with us today. Okay. Thank you so much, Alessandra, for that introduction. Let me just start from there. Okay, first of all, thank you very, very much, Alessandra, Ari, and Kelsey for this organization. And I am truly looking forward to learning from Sanover and all of you today. So let me just start with this and uh, just take my PowerPoint mostly because I am unable to have subtitles yet. So are almost my subtitles because I am sure you haven't noticed at all, but I cannot have a light accent. So let me just start saying that there is a normative narrative out there, that this normative narrative is portrayed in the media, is portrayed in much scholarship, which is that Jews and Muslims hated each other from biblical times. Today, I want to propose an alternative, uh, an counter-narrative, an alternative possibility. This is one of many perspectives, one that actually connects histories from the Atlantic and Mediterranean, but is not going to be the only possibility of explaining Jewish-Muslim relations. What I will explain today is the Jewish-Muslim enmity is largely an outcome of a global project of Christian European hegemony in place since 16th century that is emphasized its enmity since 19. It reproduces a structure who will soon define as coloniality. This project presents two irreducible sides that lack the political ethos to solve their issues, and only a third racial arbitrator or the West can actually do it. The idea has to think that there are self-containing sides and it, it make us actually think that we should talk all the time about these two self-containing sides and their actions instead of talking about the structure that is in place by this creator arbitrator that is this in the in the words of Nirnberg and Gil Hochberg is a side that is too big to be seen. This occludes the many experiences that they don't fit neatly or have different conversations. I am thinking about the work of Professor Umar, Professor Barat, eh, and Professor Benicti, eh, such as the work of the experience of Arab Jews and Christians, the elite Jews and Muslims, Jews Muslims in Africa, Latin America. And also it will lead us to what I will call misleading conclusions about Israel Palestine. Before starting, I want to emphasize I am not a historian. Perhaps I wish I was, but actually I am not. I am a sociologist of knowledge, and as such, what I am going to be looking at is about patterns of thought. And this is why my approach will be a little bit different from a traditional historian. So let me tell you why I'm going to ask a major question we have in front today, which is what is coloniality? So according to a number of scholars, something happened in what Ella Shohat calls the true for the choose. There is going to be a change of events 
that make Europe, fra, Europe pass from being a provincial contender to be a global hegemonic power. And even though structures of oppression and discourse about Jews and Muslims largely precede this time, this is a moment in which there is going to be a simultaneous creation of collectives who lack religion, history, developing civilization, and people who are stuck on the religion whose history and development are barbarism. This model has been traditionally interpreted, the first one about Africans and natives, the second one as Muslims and Jews, who are going to be understood as threat to Christian hegemonic designs and will be increasingly rationalized throughout from 1492 until today. Uh, the eventually, the conception of lacking and being stuck on has been interviewing, creating a little bit what Alexander was talking before about the multiple racialist barbarians. So coloniality as such is a matrix of racial domination emerging from colonial context that transcend time and space to be reproduced globally until today. If colonialism is not a metaphor, as we have heard many, many times, coloniality is a system, is a matrix. So this intervening construction of Jews and Muslims have continued through modernity. And before uh, there was a Judeo-Christian tradition, there was a Judeo-Islamic tradition. So this was on the one hand historically accurate. There were many Jews who were integral part of Muslim societies and Muslim rule lands were a space for the Jews for many persecuted Jews through the centuries. But it was also a racialized narrative. From the 17th to 19th century, European discourses constructed all Jews as being or having Oriental spirit, Hegel, a Palestinian race, as Kant, or the refugees, as Herder. And this is what Edward Said called the share of Orientalism and antisemitism. So what happened to this Judeo-Islamic tradition for us to actually interpret today of Jews and Muslims as eternal enemies? Between the 1830s and 1850s, imperial powers colonized Muslim lands, as in other and many other colonies, elevated minorities to held and rule. Jews were one minority among many. Some Jews take advantage of this. Some Jews persisted. Even when this has uh, um, what Albert Memmi called uh, this um, a candidacy for, uh, for, uh, candidacy for assimilation or candidacy to civilization, something that someone like Brian Shayet explored very well in his reign of Memmi. Uh, this split was not yet hegemonic. From the 1870s to the 1950s, you are going to have both Jews and Muslims call for Jewish and Muslim alliances. In the 1870s, for example, Jewish journalist Jacob Sanu coined the term edges for Egyptians. If Jews did not belong to the to the to what is called the Arab world, why he will do it. In the 1950s, Mohammed V of Morocco called for a Jewish Muslim verbal alliance against the French colonial power. After the Holocaust, the West, as M. Cesar explains, was in modern implosion, and the power of definition passes from Europe to the US. In the US, Jews have been incorporated into a white society in order to reproduce a white black binarism. These Judeo-Christian terms, and I want to point out especially to the work of Anya Topolsky on this regard, these Judeo-Christian terms, you know, who was originally an anti-Semitic term, and as I mentioned, the work of both Anya Topolsky and the work of Gil Hoshmer is, is, is presented very well, it was, it was re-articulated to incorporate and choose into the West, a West that has annihilated one third of the population in the Holocaust and replaces narrative of antisemitism on post-colonial Muslim states. These now states that had lost the main times millionary Jewish communities. So I would just say that Israel, Palestine is important. I have written about this, many others have written about that, about that in very, very good ways. Should, Jews should confront the supremacy and ethnic cleansing that was made in our name. At the same time, I want us to read Israel's Palestine, not as an end in itself, but as a symptom of a larger problem, problem which is the coloniality behind Jewish Muslim relations. Without thinking about the colonial structure of Jewish-Muslim relation, we are going to arrive to misleading conclusions. 
insisting that this is all about two sides who hate each other and have eternally doing, we are not going to be looking at the structure that was put in play by this arbitrator, that it is too big to be seen. So let me finish with this slide asking why decolonizing? I will argue that today, understanding Jewish Muslim whatever, especially Jewish Muslim relation, is largely predicated in an Euro-American hegemony, in a global Euro-American hegemony that we have referred as coloniality. This illuminates some experiences, but occludes some others as well. It gives some people authority to speak and takes away from others. But what most of the time does is to reproduce a matrix of coloniality. And as uh, Professor Umar is going to talk a little bit more from the Muslim perspective, let me just take a Jewish perspective here. Jewish decoloniality does explore how the system has, her, uh, has harmed Jews, but also explore how Jewish, different juries have been used and sometimes less acknowledged, sometimes willingly participated in the reproduction of coloniality. Decolonizing today means interrogating normative Jewish systemic positionalities, interrogating allosemitism, which means the connection between antisemitism and philosemitism, as someone expressed, and the cost to defend the patterns of racialized domination for other others, including but not exclusively Palestinians, and also for market Jews, or those Jews who we are not able to cross into the line of whiteness. Otherwise, if we don't decolonize Jewish Muslim relations, Jews will trust in the same civilization that try to annihilate or pound them for the security and comfort. So the proposal I'm going to finish with this is to start thinking Judaism and Islam or Jews or Muslims, not as self-evident entities, but in their difficult and creating entanglement, knowing that the, the end, the role is not to save the racial rule of the West, but it is to build an structures uh, that comes from the crack of this hegemonic system. Thank you so much for your time. All right, um, so I think I'll proceed next right away. Um, and at the onset, I should sincerely thank our moderator and chief organizer for the event, uh, Adi Salam Bharat, along with Kelsey Keeves for bringing together Alexandra, Santiago, and I in conversation with each other, or rather Professor Slabotsky. Professor Slabotsky and I are scholars from geographies that are not seen traditionally as sites of Jewish Muslim relations. Uh, Santiago has his origins in Argentina. I have mine in India. He teaches in America. I teach in Canada. Both of us have our own unique histories and our complex trajectories of oppression, settler colonial, participating in settler colonialism. And as my friend and dear scholar, uh, Shaista Patel always emphasizes complicity for it is imperative to note that indigenous peoples in North America are not merely minorities the way racialized and non-Black Jews and Muslims are, for example. So um, I'll be speaking a little longer than uh, San Diego, I'll hopefully be able to illuminate the trajectory of my work. It'll take about 20 minutes and I wish I could be as profound as you. Uh, let's see. Uh, so for this talk specifically, Adi requested me to focus on my trajectory in Muslim studies and how it engages specifically with the questions of caste in relationship to Indo-Islamic identity, which I argue was in turn used to produce the figure of the racialized decastified Muslim. Uh, for those who are interested in exploring this work, an article has appeared in the Journal of Caste and Global Exclusion and another in the Journal of Cultural Anthropology. Uh, towards this end, I want to also today just briefly engage with terminology such as Indian Muslim, so-called Muslim world. And then after that, I will briefly attempt to reflect on what does decolonialization imply for minorities such as Indian Muslims 
who have wrestled with accusations of Islamist separatism. Uh, unfortunately, I do not offer straightforward resolutions to the aforementioned definitional quagmires and conundrums, nor do I think that scholars and even activists for that matter should assume to know the answers if we were to view knowledges drawn from our communities and the experiences of differently marginalized communities as dialogic processes and a movement rather than a frozen universalism. Um, I should obviously state the uh, right away that Islam is not a discrete or a homogeneous category of analysis, but what I am interested in is how the state produces it as such and what impact or ruptures does this have on people's rituals, norms, and conceptions of themselves? Um, as uh, Santiago also illustrated, we know that both race and religion, as other scholars such as Geraldine Heng have also meticulously shown, emerged in a context of European Christian medieval politics and later colonialism. Religion served as a heuristic tool of othering, such as terming Muslims as Saracens or those who fabricate their claims to Prophet Abraham's lineage, and racial biomarkers were also attributed to Jewish bodies. Following the Spanish Inquisition of 1492 that saw the purging of Muslims and Jews in the Iberian Peninsula and the colonization of indigenous lands now referred to as Latin America, the longer dure history of the tenuous and spotty relationship between race and religion were further epistemically cemented under colonial structures. Uh, this includes colonial taxonomies and enunciations of groups and identities for their knowledge production, as well as divisive governance, such as the infamous divide and rule policy of the British Raj in South Asia. Indeed, as shown eloquently by Amir Mufti, the legacy of the so-called Jewish question in Europe was not merely transplanted onto the Indian context, but rather structured majority minority dialectics, which in turn produced and reified binaries such as Hindu and Muslim, Indian and Pakistani, and what I will be focusing on today more so, the liminal space of the Indian Muslim. Writing in 1999, subaltern studies historian Gyan Pandey provocatively asked, can a Muslim be Indian? While outlining the vulnerable contours of Muslim identity in post-partition India, or what Faisal Devji refers to as the ghost of Pakistan. More than 20 years later, my upcoming monograph shifts Pandey's question to instead ask, can an Indian be Muslim? The change shifts the onus to the allegedly liberal democratic Indian state and its local assemblages to illustrate how Muslim identity in post-partition India was constructed as antagonistic to the nationalist conception of who constitutes as an Indian by both secular and right-wing forces. In turn, these processes drastically altered local Muslim ideas of identity, while the dominance of Hindu majoritarian ethos fundamentally altered the diverse Muslim communities negotiation with space and belonging in their ghettos or mahallas. I demonstrate that the Indian Muslim was produced through legal, civic, and normative routes between 1947 to 1992, when the Babri Majlis was infamously abolished by Hindu militants. While many scholars have responsibly undertaken the task to show pluralism and fluidity in racial, cultural, and spatial belonging amongst Muslims in India, my work interrogates how does the term Indian Muslim get interpolated by both the states and Muslims themselves across diverse axes of identification, including gender, caste, class, region, etc. Said differently, this work attends to the politics of making both religion and nationalism as discrete and often antagonistic formations. Specifically regarding the intersection of caste and religion, I looked at the 1950s decolonial state setting era of Indian constitutionalism and its so called secularism to demonstrate how seemingly diasporate sites of language politics and the denial of affirmative action policies for some of India's most vulnerable groups of Dalit or so called untouchable Muslims coalesce to both racialize Muslims as foreigners to India and to institutionally deny them socioeconomic policies for their emancipation. These policies were rendered even more complex in some lower caste and Dalit Muslim genealogical constructions 
as they sought to trace their ancestry to Central Asia or the Middle East, hoping to eclipse the stigma of casteism, but unfortunately without any avail and often facing casteism within the Muslim community and perhaps more significantly, caste and class informed anti-Muslim politics outside the community. Collectively, these complex processes of shaping and defining the contours of Muslim minoritism in India inhabits a sphere of what can be termed as racialized decastification. These caste erasures unfortunately continue to operate in modern academic studies across borders, especially when inquiring about South Asian Muslim contexts. There's largely an assumption that global not discourses on Islamophobia, Islamists and Muslims impact and influence global South discourses. However, the process in the process, such neoliberal ideas of knowledge circulation reinforce conceptions of post-colonial innocence and water down complex trajectories of racialization in global South societies, a subject that must be complicated through endeavors such as critical Muslim studies. Another work of scholarship that I'm currently developing is the deterritorialized yet essentialist imagination of the Muslim world, including the imprint such nebulous and universalizing tropes bear for Muslim minorities, especially in global South countries such as India, China, Burma, and Central African Republic. How does the circulation of the idea of a Muslim world inform global South and global North conceptions of the gendered and racialized figure of the presumably brown cis Muslim man? And whom do these constructions seek to proactively erase and why? How do Muslims partake in these ideas of the so-called Muslim world beyond ideas of an ummah, shared beliefs and solidarity? I'm particularly interested in exploring this from a political economy and gender discursive analysis tracing the post 9-11 imperialist feminist trope of saving Muslim women from Muslim men to the unfolding discourse of Muslim women as key actors and partners to Muslim men in anti-terrorism discourses. I humbly feel that this topic also critically intervenes in neoliberal notions of area studies that have ironically reproduced what Santiago in an earlier conversation with me referred to as the Christian map a map that has Europe in the center of the world and the Middle East as the heart of the Islamic world to the exclusion of millions of others of Mus to the exclusion of millions of other Muslims. Even global Islamophobia studies has centered anti-Muslim discrimination in Europe and the West, including their ties to the Middle East. Here too, for example, events that took place during the Bosnian war and black Muslim slave histories often get relegated to the periphery. It is imperative to examine academic and mainstream conceptions of the Muslim world by examining both why certain orientalist, homogenous, and questionable, questionable narratives and assumptions about the Middle East get universalized, but also to fundamentally unsettle the assumption of who belongs to the Muslim world in order to examine vertical hierarchies, horizontal oppressions, erasures, hypervisibility, and asymmetrical power dynamics that brings together and excludes certain members of the Muslim communities, especially along the axioms of sectarian beliefs, race, caste, ethnicity, global location. This brings me to my second set of issues to reflect on, re reflect on which I'm still contemplating on what exactly does the term decolonialism mean from an Indian Muslim perspective? I'm personally not interested in highlighting the works of great individuals or specific critical thinkers from the community. Many far more brilliant scholars such as Irfan Ahmad and Hilal Ahmad have extensively written on this subject, foregrounding Indian Muslim leaders such as Maulana Azad and his complex treaties on religion and the secular state, Asghar Ali Engineer on progressive Islam and the problem with codifying Sharia, Hamid Umar Dalwai on socialist Muslims ut utopia, Ali Anwar on oppressed caste or Pasmanda Muslim struggles, Begum Rukaya on fem feminist theologies and aspirations. What I am interested in is the political colonization of the Indian Muslim psyche as defined through the borders of what or who constitutes as an authentic Indian. And since I'm certainly not the spokesperson of millions of Muslims in India, let me give you an honest personal journey with the term. Growing up in India, the term decolonial conjured to my mind a temporal paradigm. 
loosely referred to as the period when countries in the global south were attaining freedom from European colonial rules. Sometimes between my undergraduate and graduate years, after coming across a torn copy of Fran Fanon's Wretched of the Earth, my perpetually pizza yearning mind was broadly came to associate the term with aspirations and values that could not be addressed adequately by colonial structures or neo-colonialism. In recent years, however, especially after moving to Canada, after having lived in continental Europe, the term decolonization is not a metaphor, but Tuck and Yang has made it abundantly clear that land is and must be a central feature of decolonial politics. Keeping that in mind, I feel that one cannot talk about decolonialism without acknowledging two critical facets of Indian Muslim identity today and their relationship to other marginalized groups in India. Firstly, Kashmir is still occupied as I speak with Article 370 of the Indian Constitution abrogating earlier provisions of granting the conflict-ridden zone a degree of autonomy in its affairs. According to Human Rights Watch, Kashmir is face, has been facing a complete lockdown since fall 2019, with untold human rights abuses, missing persons, and clamped down on journalists trying to bring to the fore the horrors and torture of their people. Indian Muslims, on the other hand, are facing another struggle with regards to the question of land and belonging. The Citizenship Amendment Act passed by the Indian state in 2019 will render millions of Muslims in India stateless, possibly making them the world's largest stateless population in time. News outlets such as The Guardian is already reporting that detention camps the size of seven football fields have already been set up in Northeast Indian states such as Assam. Very few Indian Muslims can even have the luxury to articulate their solidarity with Kashmir when they themselves are at the forefront of violence, such as the recent program in Delhi right after Donald Trump's visit to India. The second facet that I wanted to dwell upon further is the very parameters of Indian Muslim identities made legible through the nationalist territorial positioning as Indian. What does Indian Muslim decolonial thought mean after the creation of Pakistan in 1947 and Bangladesh in 1971, with India as a Hindu majority country couched between two Muslim majority countries, each with their own set of political complications and representations of their polity. I do not have a clear answer, but I hope to demonstrate the complexities of these issues by way of example through an Indian Muslim feminist collective to which I will come to shortly. Before that, in addition to the obvious fragility of Indian secularism and majoritarian politics that we are witnessing today, it is also important to note what Weil Halak shows in his, shows in his important work, Impossible States, as questionable forms of so-called Sharia and Islamic governance that has failed to ground itself along the principles of justice, welfare, and ijtihad, which I loosely translate as critical self-reasoning. The Islamist constitutional battles in Egypt and Pakistan, the Islamic legal and political failures of the Iranian revolution, the tyranny of Saudi Arabia, including its alliances with major Western powers, and recent attempts by Turkey to represent itself as the leader of the Muslim world while passing regressive measures and other similar disappointments underscore this fact. Nevertheless, the state remains the favored template of the Islamists and ulema. A decolonial effort, even from an Islamic liberation theology, requires the uncoupling of the centralizing apparatus that plays the role of the panoptic in God. But the process of holding the state accountable invariably relies also on state recognition of the problem, a process that has proven to be tenuous for Muslims in India with controversial verdicts often meted out by the Supreme Court of the country Never mind legislative acts that overlook the concerns of the masses, including the ongoing farmer protests and surveillance and uh, surveillance of Dalit activists and academics. Furthermore, issues of patriarchy and casteism within the Muslim community is often problematically appropriated, even by supposedly progressive and secular quarters, to stigmatize Muslims in India without providing resources to challenge these critiques. Muslim women, especially from poor and lower class backgrounds, 
who find themselves at the intersections of violent crimes that go unaddressed, sometimes for even decades after massacres, and as subjects that proclaim their rights as citizens are well aware of these conundrums. Take, for example, the recent Be Back Collective Manifesto, bravely published by Muslim women in two before the 2019 elections from various walks of life. They called out systematic neglect of Muslim ghettos, mass-scale anti-Muslim violence, the heavy incarceration rates of Muslim men, the decades of waiting for justice when their families are killed and their bodies raped. It is not a singular focus on gender rights and critiquing patriarchal practices in the community exclusively, but a holistic framework where they see themselves as a part of a system hinged on impacting their intimate lives and in distressing, distressing ways, including when their calls for theologies of liberation have historically been overlooked by the state, which today, not only manipulatively presents itself as a savior of Muslim women from Muslim men, but also problematically criminalizes and targets exclusively Muslim men for engaging in patriarchal practices. Notably, this collective also extends solidarity to Hindu minorities in Pakistan and Bangladesh, but also astutely observes that women's religious agency is a project that is not a private affair, but indeed a very public matter when minority religions get surveilled and scrutinized. In a sense, the issue is not merely the relationship between patriarchy or minority discrimination. It is a complexity of accounting for racializing tropes grounded in religion specifically, often beyond physiological assumptions and constructions of race and even caste hierarchies in capitalist economies of different and intersecting social marginalization of various groups. For those of us defined and constrained by various states of violence and state violence, decolonial imaginations, particularly those led by feminists from marginalized backgrounds, offers a means of integrating complex questions about land, capitalism, life, and alternatives offered by theologies and hermeneutical interpretations that compel us to rethink the very idea of community, to pluriversal values of freedom from violence and the right to fundamental human dignity. And while these spaces exist and offer brilliant possibilities, Coloniality is a system that has also entrenched and informed internal subaltern perspectives and dynamics too. The deference from power as domination, be it institutional or otherwise, is not going to be easy, but it is an endeavor still worth dreaming and exploring. Thank you. Thank you very much, Santiago and, uh, and Sonoba for these very uh, productive um, um, discussions and uh, explorations. Uh, I'd like to invite uh, Santiago first to um, to respond to to Sanuber and then Sanuber to uh, to respond to Santiago's uh, presentation before we open it up for a uh, larger discussion. If that's okay. Thank you very much, Adi. Uh, Sanover, you know, as I think I told you before, I have a little bit of advantage because we have been in dialogue with Sanover for some time now, and I have here this paper yesterday as well. So I have a little more advantage than you, so I'm sorry if I do so. But I am fascinated by many aspects of Sanover's presentation. I just want to point out something because I want to hear more her and, and all of you than myself. I just want to point out that uh, we both understand the coloniality as, um, as a path for us to criticize the system uh, but also understand that it is not that easy to understand what is alternative. Uh, the system has been so, um, uh, I would say, so pernicious that uh, has presented certain structures that doesn't as it doesn't enable us to see very well what are alternatives because the questions that poses. Uh, require certain answers that might not break the system. And I think Sanover explained much better than myself how this happened in, uh, in the context of India and Muslims in particular, but I think we can see how in different places happens. So the question here is, with Sanover, I think we agree that the system is pernicious, that perhaps the questions are the wrong ones, but we both identify there are cracks. 
we both identify that there are possibilities that emerge from different places. And I just remember a book I just read from an excellent scholar called Dalia Candiotti, who is called The Return of the Converso, where she explains that many times when there is an, which I think she was in this network as well at some point, but um, when she explained that when there is uh, a system that doesn't allow certain bosses to emerge, uh, so they are not archives to actually understand them. Traditional historians have understood, has made narratives out of archives. And perhaps we need to start making um, um, archives out of narratives. Uh, these examples of what Sanovar has been explained is an excellent example of what Dalia Candiotti does with the multidirectional memory of Rothbard that Alessandra was explaining before. Understanding that there is a memory in a way of narration that it happened in those bodies that have been bonded by coloniality, but they, have, they haven't been swallowed by coloniality in such a way that they are creating a different history. There is no purity. These cracks are dirty. These cracks have, there is no possibility of not being dirty when someone has the boot in your head. There is no possibility of purity but there is a possibility of something else. So I think that both Sanovera and myself understand that in the dirt, in the uncomfortability, in the violence of those cracks, we can create new archives out of narratives, as Talia Candiotti said. And I want to express that this is done, as Sanovera explained very well, especially by women who have uh, who has suffered the multiple level of racialization in multiple places of the world and are able to express themselves very well. I just finishing with this, and this is why I'm saying this. I came from a society where my own community, Argentinian Jews, have been, a, it was a genocide against them not long time ago during the dictatorship in the 70s and 80s. We are out of all the people who are kidnapped and kill, choose represent over 12% when they are all less than 1% of the population. The people who led the struggle for these people were women. The mothers of Plaza de Mayo or the mothers of Mayo Square who actually led and confronted a military government backed by Western powers in order to understand and create a different archive out of their narratives. And I just think these are the cracks that we need to start looking at. I mean, I, absolutely, um, Santiago, I, um, you know, uh, Salman Sayyid in his uh, book has also con uh, talked about a decolonial Islamic aid, which is, I think, such a promising premise. And, you know, it's one of the foundational texts for critical Muslim studies. And, and, and uh, his book, Fundamental Fears, published before 9-11, in a way predicted the Islamist uh, thrust that we are seeing right now in the fear in, uh, in the global North. But the question constantly remains, who represents this Islamic aid? Who speaks for this decolonial Islamic aid? Um, nonetheless, even though it's a messy process, like you said, there, it, there are possibilities. They exist and there are possibilities, however messy. Mm. Specifically regarding Indian Muslim feminists, it's, it's been interesting, uh, something I think for those who are not aware in this audience, um, in 1985, there was a controversial judgment in India known as the Shahbanu case, uh, in, in which codified Muslim personal law in India and the idea and reified the idea of instant divorces known as triple talaq. At the time, several Muslim activists, feminists, and organizations were calling for an Islamic perspective against such practices. And it should be noted that this practice is not prevalent in the Middle East. It's not prevalent even in other South Asian countries like Pakistan and Bangladesh. But the Supreme Court of India went ahead with the verdict that uh, the practice of triple talaq can be uh, can be uh, uh, can can exist. And of course, it created untold anxieties and worries for thousands and thousands of Muslim women, very distressing for them. What was telling about this moment, though, was that the Supreme Court decided to give legitimacy to an NGO 
a non-government organization called All India Muslim Personal Law Board. And this was an NGO led mostly by conservative ulema members who were not even elected to that organization. It was just pure nepotism. So you, here you have the state granting legitimacy to patriarchal actors over other feminist contenders. And, and I think, and now uh, come 2018, 2019, and there's a law that is passed against triple talaq, which a lot of Muslim feminists welcome, but Muslim men are getting criminalized for practicing triple talaq, which is very problematic in a country like India, given the heavy persecution and already heavy incarceration rates of Muslim men, but also the country has various patriarchal practices culturally and religiously. So, it's, it's very interesting, this conundrum between Muslim women who want to protect Muslim men, who want to call out a holistic analysis for their communities, but also simultaneously have to summon themselves to the state as rights-bearing subjects, the same state that has persecuted them. And, and, and I, think it's, I think what I appreciate about the Be Back Collective is its awareness of these complexities especially from an Indian Muslim perspective, because as I mentioned, whereas Kashmiri struggle for the Azad Kashmir can be broadly understood as the struggle for their own land, freedom from occupation, freedom from Indian military and Pakistani infiltration, violence and all of that. Uh, the Indian Muslim struggle right now with the Citizenship Amendment Act is to remain in the country which they have known all their lives. So these are two different struggles of land, labor, and even feminisms. So contingent on the state, yeah. Thank you, Sanobo. Santiago, do you want to add something? No, no, I think that, you know, it would be great to actually listen to the voice of everyone. So thank you, Ali. All right, um, I'm, I'm going to maybe um, make, make use of the privileged position of, uh, of moderator to Ask the first question, and I, um, Kelsey, if you could open up the chat as well, um, you should be able to um, post your questions in the chat. But also, uh, you can raise use the raise hand function, and uh, hopefully, it's hopefully I'll be able to see it, and then I can unmute you uh, to ask um, your your questions if you want to do it orally. Um, the first question that I want to pose to to uh, to the two of you is is quite a general one. Um, I was. Thinking, listening to, to what you both said, I was thinking about the uh, description uh, to the event. And um, I think, uh, full disclosure, I, I, I wrote most of that description. Uh, and um, I was rethinking something that, that I that I written. I think I'd written something about uh, drawing on, um, on uh, Southern epistemologies to broaden the horizon of Jewish and Muslim um, studies. And listening to the two of you speak, I think, I think I must uh, rethink that because that's not so much what um, what this endeavor is um, as it as it is uh, drawing on um, our disciplinary backgrounds and um, and the tools provided in our disciplinary backgrounds to advance um, a project of um, of decoloniality rather than drawing on decoloniality to. Uh, say reform or broaden Jewish studies or Muslim studies or for that mat matter uh, religious studies or anthropology sociology so on and so forth I, I wonder if you if you agree with that um, that reformulation or, or, um, or if you have other thoughts on on that reformulation so now do you want to start or I can start I don't mind uh, sharing a few quick thoughts as you say that um, Adi thanks San Diego for letting me uh, go ahead um, for me, when talking about the universal Muslim subject, and it's it's very interesting because global South countries, um, as uh, Sylvia Ang has argued, global South countries, post-colonial countries, they're not just mere, merely emulating colonial models. They're also reproducing, modifying, and enumerating their own uh, disempowered com communities. And, we have to, on the one hand, acknowledge colonial legacies and structures that have persisted in the post-colonial sphere, but we also have to simultaneously engage with how post-colonial states create their own uh, structures. So 
for me, in terms of a global South epistemology, we have to contend with European legacy. We have to contend with the colonial legacy of how both Jews and Muslims were constructed. Um, you know, Yulia Egrova has actually talked about Jews and Muslims in India and their interactions and how those identities are constructed as antagonistic to each other, but also at the same time share similarities on how conditional their humanity is, be it for the Hindu right, be it for the European right. And I think in that sense, it's, it's a conversation that doesn't just flow from the global south to the global north. It's a conversation that is a mishmash, uh, if you want to really acknowledge the matrix of coloniality, so to speak. Um, thank you, Andrea. Thank you so much, Sanover. I, I would agree to, to some extent, I for sure agree with Sanover. At the same time, you know, sometimes one can make it explicit in such a short amount of time. But you know what? They got the, uh, my understanding of the matrix of coloniality of power is coming from Latin American the colonial thinkers. Uh, my conception of the need of what is called identity in politics, issue of identity politics, is coming from the struggles of memory in Argentina. Uh, the conception of the role of the, Jew, the Jews, uh, the, the Jews between a colonial situation, especially in North Africa, comes from Albert Memi. So when actually start to uh, uh, to to um, to understand the different pieces of at least I will talk at the individual level of the proposal I am making, I just think that it is impossible to understand without uh, uh, without the contribution the Global South has made. That doesn't mean that people from the Global South are the only ones who can express Global South thinking. And this is something that Joao Ventura de Sosa, de Sosa Santos in, in Portugal explained very, very well. We need to start thinking a little bit what means Global South epistemologies uh, and what are the reach of it, who can use it and who cannot use it, how it's being used or not. Uh, at the same time, I believe that there is certain kind of reason of why uh, sorry, Sanover, for including you, but I think you're going to agree with me, but Sanover and myself, why we are thinking about this? We are thinking about this because my community has had a genocide in the past. Sanover knows that something is coming from her community. And we both understand that both this has to do with the legacy of colonialism, colonialism and coloniality. And also because we do trust that the cracks that exist in the global south are able to think more thoughtfully uh, about the situations that happen there. That doesn't mean that they're going to be pure. That doesn't mean that we can uh, we can uh, deny the existence of very good contributions being made in other places. Uh, that doesn't mean that uh, that uh, that there is no dialogue and permanently back and forth. Uh, but I do believe, as I express in many places, which I think that the experiences of racialization in the global south lead to understand more deeply, more quickly, uh, and more, I would say even transcendentally, uh, the role of coloniality. That doesn't mean that someone from the global south will get it and someone from the global north will not get it, but it means that there are possibilities. Uh, my, the ethos that animates me, uh, what doesn't let me sleep at night, which is ultimately what makes you, you know, a, a researcher, uh, are the questions that has to do with biography. It has to do with the fact of growing up doing a dictatorship that was back for Western powers, knowing and being trained by people who have suffered because not only because they were Jews, but also because they were revolutionary Jews. Um, uh, so I believe that experience on the one hand and the epistemology emerging from people like Ella Shohat, Walter Mignolo, Aníbal Quijano, uh, uh, Maria Lugones, um, uh, Abel Memi, Ellen Sissou, who are both, in my case, Maghrebian and Latin American scholars, is what allow me to actually explain what I try to explain. Uh, it's not exclusive, but without them, I wouldn't be able to actually make sense of what animates me to do my work. So Adi, I'm sorry for contradicting you here, but I think that your actual, for me, the description you have made of, of, of this conversation is actually accurate of what at least, I don't know if I did it, but I, what I was trying to do. 
you, no need to to apologize. Uh, it's it's only out of uh, out of these kinds of contradictions and uh, disagreements and then agreements and entanglements that uh, we make any progress uh, in in any case. So uh, I'm I'm very happy for the uh, for the disagreement. Uh, we have a few um, uh, questions already, and uh, Is Iskander Abbasi has his uh, hand uh, raised. So. Um, We'll we'll take the questions in the chat uh, first, and then and then head over to to uh, to his kind of to ask um, his his question. Unless unless you're in a rush to go, um, no, okay. Um, so the um, so the questions are in the chat. You can have a look at them. I'll read them out um, um, just in case anyone needs it to be read out. Uh, the first one is from Nestor uh, Medina. Thank you both presenters for your rich presentations. I just have a basic question. Since both of you are deploying the language of decolonization and uh, decolonial, I'm wondering if you would speak to what is it we are decolonizing, we in inverted commas, what would that look like once it is, or if it is decolonized? I think we can group these questions. Um, the next one is uh, by Nuruddin Al-Akbar. My questions to Sanabar Umar, what about the opportunities for the decolonization of Muslims in India, especially under the current Modi government, regarding the idea of liberation theology, I would like to get a further explanation from you about how the development of this discourse in India, including among Indian Muslim feminists to date, in including its influence on decolonization opportunities. Thank you. And the last one, um, I think it's relatively in the same realm, is from Clive Gabe. Um, for Santiago, um, when it comes to decolonizing Judaism, what is the end point? For instance, I find it very difficult to maintain the category of Jew slash Judaism in light of the kinds of historical legacies, Al-Andalus, etc., you are drawing from. So when we identify any kind of purity as colonial and the reality of Jewish experience as being fundamentally in dialogue with and indeed constituted by Islam and Christianity in some senses, then what are we left with? Do you want to start? Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, I'm wondering if you would speak to what we are decolonizing, what would that look like once it itself is decolonized? So I think in my talk, what I'm actually trying to do is not to give a definition of what we are trying to decolonize as much as say we are in a bit of a, especially for Indian Muslims, because like I've been trying to point out, it's an identity constituted by by the parameters of territoriality, by the parameters of nationalist territoriality, which is very different from what the word decolonization would mean for, or say in the Kashmiri context. Uh, the dreams for Azad Kashmir and freedom from Indian occupation is very different from Indian Muslim concerns to survive and live in that very land within India. So there is no we in this decolonization is what I'm trying to point out, but simultaneously where I think decolonization as a term still matters is to both be conscious of state structures and, and a structural critique of power, but also to build coalitions with other communities that are facing intersecting or different forms of marginalization, such as the Adivasi community, the Dalit community, uh, the farming community, uh, linguistic minorities, so many issues. So India is a subcontinent in itself, of, of itself. So what I'm thinking of as decolonial possibilities is also recognizing our differences in how the state has marginalized us, but also coming together, recognizing those differences and not seeing those differences as exaggerated or discrete categories, but to also unsettle those assumptions, especially when it comes to Muslims in India. There's so much cultural, ethnic, linguistic diversity that they are actually grounds, common grounds to be found. The legacy of post-colonial coloniality, so to speak, is to try to remove those grounds, is to try to create homogenous Indian Muslims, is to try to create a homogenous idea of Islam. So that is also a project of decolonization in some senses, to be aware of how the state has created certain discrete categories and to unsettle those legacies of the state 
through building collisions, through re revisiting the very idea of community or communities. Yeah, thank you so much. So, but, so let me ask, I think the first question was from Nestor and the second from Clive, it's true. Uh, so let me just try to answer first of all the question of Nestor. I think Nestor, you know, also we have a, a, a long-standing conversation with him. So um, I will just try to actually acknowledge uh, the, the question that he that is burning. I think he's completely right about who is the we. Okay, who is the we? If we do think that colonization is sort of a metaphor, and there are some people who uh, actually suffer the confiscation of land, the complete reduction to an identity they identify, so are we all in the same way decolonizing? Um, so who is the we? And I think my answer to this is that the system has, has taken all of us. The system has bounded many, but uh, hasn't swallowed everyone. And as such, I believe that the system has gave some of us privilege, some of us unprivileged, and some of that, and some of us, most of us, everything in between. And as such, I believe that uh, as colonialities might need to be understood, start to be understood as a plural, the colonialities as well. This is why, you know, in my work, I don't intend, and I'm going to jump very close to, to Clive's clear question, okay? Um, uh, I don't intend to give a full answer how, how a decolonized Judaism is going to look like, like, not even the colonized Jews would look like. It's because we have in place in different places, actually we have always, juries around the world have always been in different places, and as such, different answers need to give to this. So my first answer to Nestor, I want to be sure I answer correctly, is that the we will depend on the location in which it happened. In Latin America, for example, in particular, okay, I do know that as a Jew with both European and Arab background, I have given certain privileges, but in Argentina in particular, with the Catholic structure that led to a genocide in the 70s and 80s has also led to much of unprivileged as well. Today, that unprivileged in Argentina has almost disappeared. In the global sense, we still have it, but not in the local sense. In the past was different. And as such, as a Argentinian Jew, I'm going to give one answer. And uh, right now, I am working a little bit, and jumping into what Clyde was saying, I am working a little bit on something I haven't done before. Once we identify the problem, once we see the complexity, the question is, and really hopefully going straight to Clyde's question, is where the clocks lead us? Uh, and the, the point here is that the cracks is going to lead us to different places. So I will just bring one example of this, is one of the things I'm working right now. I want to bring you the story of what is someone called Patito Zucker. Patito is called the Little Duck, okay? In the 1970s, uh, he is a guy, a revolutionary Jew, who was uh, in a very heavy revolutionary struggles, and he was persecuted by the government. Almost two or three times, he was almost killed. Uh, and as such, he was offered the possibility of going to Israel, as many of uh, many Jews actually set themselves doing that. So instead of going to Israel, he took advantage of the relation between his uh, or, uh, revolutionary organization and the Palestinians to go and get trained by Palestinians in Lebanon. So Patito Zucker, and we, I have the diaries of him, so it's why I'm working a little bit with this, okay? That crack he opened there is, he has a choice. Okay, he could be having coffee in, in Tel Aviv, but he decided to actually go join the Palestinian uh, uh, training camp, okay, uh, and learn about it and come back to Argentina to make the revolution. Uh, and he has wonderful phrases. I'm sorry, it's just too, too, too much to be, but I, he's, he's, also, he's also very funny. His father is a very no humor uh, uh, comedian, so he has a lot of great things uh, that I, sorry, I can't tell now, but. Uh, that creates a crack, you know, and I will tell you is that doesn't work for everyone, okay? That creates a crack. Which crack is created by this little duck sucker, okay? This little duck sucker creates a crack in which he takes a decision and identity in politics and understand who are his people. Uh, he is not looking for comfort. He is not looking for security, even though this was offered to him. He's looking for something else. Of course, he's going to go there and, and, and after he was trained how to port like this huge weapon, huge Uzi, and say, yes, I want to see how happened in the middle of Buenos Aires, myself carrying a big, a big Uzi, so going to work. So he also see the, the problems between one and the other. But the point here is that, you know, different Jews who felt 
that uh, that uh, the positionality in which you were placed were not fitting with him, opted for alternative possibilities. Uh, and this is not about ambiguity. There is no ambiguity when he uh, he receives the bombing of the Israeli army uh, in the place where he was in Lebanon. Okay, there's absolutely no ambiguity there. He could be killed by this bombing. He could be killed when he came back to Argentina. Okay, but he has decided. Uh, what I call a border thinker, which is someone who has been put in between and decide to take a side. Uh, I am now exploring different cracks in different places that they are going to lead to different kinds of Judaisms. Uh, and even though it's very tempting for me to say my version is the universal consciousness, and I was trained originally in Marxism, so it's very natural for me to do it, okay? I will restrict myself of doing it. Understanding that perhaps and only perhaps we need to start thinking that for a long time there was no normative Judaism. There were different centers that they have different kind of powers. And the relation between with the center was mostly through responsa was mostly through uh, asking questions to the center to answer and every community is going to adapt whatever they want to adapt. I just think that perhaps is the moment for us to return to a space of networks instead of normativity. Uh, for me, Israel is a problem, but it's not just a problem. Of course, principle is a problem because of the racialization and the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians, first and foremost. But also it is a problem because it hegemonizes the possibility of experiencing Judaism. And I want us, as some of us can do what Paito Sukar did, and some of us will do other things. And this is what I am working right now. So, Clive, please, uh, hopefully, we can keep in dialogue. And very soon, I'm going to come up with something. I am working on this. I don't have it right now, but I will have it at some point. Thank you, Santiago Sanobel. Let's go right to Iskandar. I'm going to unmute you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, salam, shalom. Um, my name is Iskander. Um, I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Johannesburg. Um, and my research happens to focus in um, Islamic liberation theology and Islam and decoloniality too. Um, I really, really enjoyed and appreciated this uh, presentation by uh, Profs Slaboski and uh, um, uh, Omar. Um, I have one question and I just need uh, one comment in order to get to that question and I will keep it concise, I promise. Um, uh, so I'm much more familiar with uh, Prof Slabotsky's work um, and I, uh, you know, kind of the concept of uh, an alternative Muslim Jewish solidarity has also been something very real to me um, as, a, as a Palestinian American and someone involved in Palestine solidarity, um, I feel like that concept has made a lot of sense, especially in Palestine solidarity, um, in the United States, in South Africa, and, and possibly in other locations. Um, and I can kind of just, I have a better feel for, you know, what is this alternative um, that we're trying to build, you know, in relation to coloniality and um, you know, this so-called secular Judeo-Christian, you know, hegemony. Um, and uh, in relation to, to, to Dr. Omar's project, um, the, the one question I had for you, Dr. Omar, so um, I really, really appreciated your kind of, um, your, your, your reverse gaze at the Indian state, you know, rather than saying, you know, I'm gonna start talking about Indian, what about the state? You know, this is not about Indian Muslims. The Indian state is the problem. Um, so I really, really appreciated, uh, you know, th that step in terms of, of, of your engagement on this, on this topic. And in, in, in terms of, you know, also, I know you were saying, you know, you're, you're not necessarily trying to provide a counter, you know, in, in your work in the same way maybe Prof Slabotsky is, and you're really focusing on the analysis first. So uh, in, in my limited understanding of, of, of the Indian context, you know, I'm, 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 a, I'm, I'm familiar through a, a comrade, a colleague um, who's involved in uh, the, the Dalit Bahujan Muslim Alliance movements. 
Um, and I was just kind of curious if, if, uh, if you can comment on maybe how does their framework relate to your project? Because from my understanding, they see the Indian state primarily to, through two lens, which is uh, uh, casteism, Brahmanism, and Islamophobia as kind of the primary organizing principles. Um, and in many ways, the coloniality discourse from you know, the Americas has not necessarily dealt with the issue of caste <laughs> in South Asia. Um, and um, it's, it's been interesting to hear from, from some of these, these, these people I know there, how they're trying to kind of work through these problems. But I was just curious, you know, what, what's your take on how they're viewing the Indian state and how it relates to your project? Uh, Santiago, uh, do you want to go first or should I go ahead? Go ahead, go ahead, please. Okay, uh, thank you. That's that's a really great question, Iskander. Um, so regarding Dalit Bahujan Muslim alliances against casteism or Brahmanical supremacy and even our lack of awareness about casteism in general, you know, um, Addy said something very beautifully in the beginning of this conversation, which is we are here to not just learn from each other, or reconsider our perspectives, but to also think about silences. And why do we sometimes have ignorance about certain aspects? And if I was to be very bluntly honest, North American academia, Western academia rather in general, mostly has post-colonial scholars who are upper caste. They write about the subaltern. They're wondering whether they can re recuperate the uh, consciousness of the subaltern, this undecipherable subaltern and so forth. But we are talking about a very privileged group of academics who a lot of Dalits, lower caste groups, and now Muslims as well, Muslims from poorer and lower caste backgrounds, have accused rightly so of not questioning caste enough because you know you come to North America you become the brown body but you don't investigate your own caste privileges so I think we have to and this is not I'm not saying this necessarily from an accurate accusative tone as much as a tone of these are the silences we all have to reflect about uh, coming to the other part of your question on uh, what do these alliances offer and the critiques of the Indian state as casteist and Islamophobic. My entry point is that Islamophobia in India is informed by caste. So the two are not discrete categories uh, that come together and critique some idea of Brahmin supremacy. In fact, I would even go ahead and say a good part of the Indian state is not necessarily run by Brahmins, academia is good part, but like not necessarily the state. The state has multiple caste groups, including the middle caste who are running it. Uh, but so I, I go with the term Savarna supremacy, which means people who have caste. Dalits are people who don't have caste because they're considered outcast. But back to the, my original point, a lot of Muslims, as scholars like Remy Delage have shown, Sin and Richard Eaton, have since medieval times converted to Islam from lower caste and Dalit backgrounds. And like I mentioned, one of the ways that they were able to try to able to eclipse this casteism was to have surnames that didn't reflect their original caste heritage necessarily. And these were ways of empowering themselves. But of course, after the post-colonial Indian state was made, affirmative action policies was given to Dalits who identified as Hindu, not Dalits who were Christian or Muslim. The idea being that Dalit Hindus are indigenous to India, whereas Muslims and Christians were easily racialized as foreigners to India. In fact, a lot of the right wing discourse that we see right now in India is very interesting. You can also again see this quagmire over here where on the one hand, Muslims are constantly represented as medieval foreign invaders against whom post-colonial revenge needs to be exacted. But on the other hand, 
a lot of uh, the project of Hindu Rashtra or what David Ludden calls making India Hindu also is premised on the idea that Muslims reconvert to Hinduism in a process known as Ghar Wapsi, very tellingly known as return home. So what I'm trying to point out over here is caste in Islamophobia in India are not discrete categories. They're actually very much informed by each other. What makes Islamophobia more interestingly potent is of course how since 9-11 or even before that, discourses from the global north add to that fuel, add fire to that fuel. <laughs> yeah, sorry, add fuel to that fire, sorry, yeah. Uh, I would like to add something if you don't mind, especially the first part of Iskandar question, which is, okay, at the end, the question is, what do we do with our privilege when generating theory? Uh, and I think that's something very, very important because as I said before, uh, I still believe, I strongly believe that uh, employing Southern uh, epistemologies to understand the whole globe is actually very helpful. Uh, at the same time, the question is that, we, what do we do with them? So for example, Okay, uh, there are people with, there are, there are spaces with privileges that they can do something else with that privilege. I will um, uh, recall you, for example, the work of Susanna Heschel that explained very well how German Jews that globally might have some privilege are rethinking Orientalism, and sometimes even initiating Orientalism in Germany as a way to actually criticize the West as not as a mention of the East. At the same time, I want to go to Latin America itself, where uh, Silvia Riole Cuscani actually explains very well that he, she has, you know, which is one of the major theorists uh, of, of the colonialism in Bolivia. She explains very much that she has a privilege. And what is her privilege? Her privilege is she is descendant both from natives in Americans and crypto Jews. And as such, she is a mestiza. But she says she's a mestiza, which in Bolivia means certain level of power, eh, persecuted by the empire in two ways. So she is going to mobilize that privilege, not to talk just about the asymmetries of power, but understanding how these different identities intermingle in order to illuminate something, something the system has done. Part of her people are colonized. Part of her people came to the American somehow colonizers, but as soon as they were um, uh, unveiled, you know, it's just call it like the way, you know, like the Orientalist conception, you know, uh, are going to actually be burned in the stake by Inquisition. So instead of thinking about different levels of privilege, which you should, let's just think about how these entanglements of history leaders for different people in different parts of the world, interrogating the system by mobilizing certain kind of questions that would lead us to different way, ways of confronting coloniality. From German Jews to mestizas in, in Bolivia, we are going to see that everyone can engage with this discourse as soon as we actually acknowledge the positionality in which we're placed in the system. We are all trapped. Some people suffer from it, some people benefit from it. And I think we need a decolonial uh, engagement from both one and the other, and the majority of people who are in between. Thank you very much uh, again for that, uh, for that response. Um, and thank you Iskandar for that very uh, deep question. We have time, I think, for, for the last two <clears throat> questions which have been posted in the uh, chat. If you scroll up, you'll see them. The first one is from uh, Isabel Frey, and I'll read it out. What is needed to foster a collective understanding of the role of Jews in coloniality? Is it, a, is, it about a, is it about a reflection of white privilege in particular contexts, or rather a rereading of Jewish history as a victim of colonial of coloniality, or is it rather about an understanding of imperialist interests and the roles of Jewish communities in Sorry, global I'm sorry, capitalism? that is Isabel asking the question? Sorry? Isabel Frey. I think Ali froze. Well, I will just try to answer a little bit. Uh, as I expressed before, hello? 
Hello? We, we can hear you. Oh no. Hi. Can, can, can you hear me? Hello? Is Santiago? I think we might have lost Santiago. I'm, I'm not sure if, if, uh, if I'm lost as well now. Yes, hello. I am, I am back. Okay, you're back. Hello? Yes, sorry for that. You know, I thought that, you know, was, was you, that was me. Okay, so uh, the question was from Isabel, if I'm not wrong. That was for yes. me. Uh, okay, good. Uh, so let me just, sorry, revise it because I was trying to, uh, what it is understood. As I expressed a little bit before, I believe that, uh, you know, to talk about an entity, a self-contained entity called Judaism, the Jewish people, uh, actually right now is a little bit misleading. Uh, at the same time, there are networks of, uh, of I would say, networks of juries that place them globally in the same place. So I just think different communities will need different things. Uh, what I can tell you is that in some places, the binary between white and black will work very well. Uh, and I uh, think that in the US might be a possibility uh, in places, especially colonized by by the, the British Empire will be will be very helpful. And I think that in other in other structures, it, you know, the conception of whiteness is different. For example, in Argentina, everyone was declared as white. So as you know, as far as you know, how, how that binary actually lead, of course, that erase certain blackness in the country that place everyone uh, that transform all racial systems into class systems so that has complications but you know the black white binary might not work very well so what i think that for jews what will require for jews is to understand their positionality the positionality i think that um you know i remember a long time ago when i was very very young uh, talking to an ambassador of israel in argentina who was very proudly saying the following. He was saying, look, for a very long time we have been stateless, we are now stateful because you can remain your country and Israel will defend you, or you can come to Israel and Israel will be your home. So this, uh, uh, the, uh, what he was trying to express is that there is a turning point in the normativization of Jews between a global dynamics that is novel. I would, not, I would not say it's novel in terms of different experiences experience in different parts of the world in which Jews were very safe. We are learning more and more about uh, the Jewish collaboration with uh, slave trade in the Caribbean. We are learning much more about the displacement, for example, of Jews in South Africa in context of apartheid. We know, so, and I keep going, going, and going. So it's not exclusive about Israel Palestine. But at the same time, after the Second World War, we are going to see a normativization of the role of Jews globally that we actually need to pay attention to. That happened in the same way, no, that happened to all Jews, no, black Jews didn't, didn't enjoy it. Actually, Arab Jews were re racialized. Are uh, is the philosemitism of in Europe of Jews a very different from the anti-Semitism or is actually a different kind of maneuver. Well, we need to discuss this in context, but at the same time, I believe that there has been a change of normative jury from, from a, a self-conception of a statelessness to a self-conception of a, a, of a state, you know, a, a full state a, or a full power. And I think that this is, I believe, a very good place to start. Senova, do you want to add anything to that? Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, can you remind me whose question uh, we are focusing on? This is the question by uh, Isabel Frey. And, um, and once we're done with this, we'll end with uh, Charles Williams's question. If you scroll up, you'll see Isabel's question. Yeah. You know, I think Santiago just uh, answered it way more eloquently than I possibly can. I also kind of want to make a note over here. I'm, I'm not, I'm, 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 I'm not surprised at all. People are not familiar with my works. I think I should just state at the onset. I got a tenure track job last year. I graduated last year. So, yeah, keep a lookout. Hopefully, I'll be writing more. Uh, but yeah, Santiago, thanks for your answer. <laughs> and I'll, I'll add to that that I, I discovered uh, Sanobel's work, um, which has been uh, 
really useful for me and really helpful for, for me in thinking about my own work uh, at a panel that she was uh, presenting on just a few months ago. And I immediately thought um, that uh, this, that her perspectives would speak very, very well in tandem with uh, Santiago's work, uh, particularly his book, Decolonial Judaism. And I think it's worked um, very well, even if as uh, uh, Sanabur said, it's um, it's not what someone would think when when they hear the the, the words uh, Jewish Muslim dialogue or um, to, to to have this conversation from um, the perspective of an Argentinian Jew and an Indian Muslim, even as we complicate what it means to be an Argentinian Jew and an Indian um, uh, Muslim. But I think that's particularly why it's been uh, so uh, enlightening for me to uh, to to uh, to hear your perspectives, and I'm sure for everyone else. So let's um, move on to Charles Williams's um, question. If you um, scroll down, you will uh, you'll see it. I'm I'm going to read it now because we're recording, and uh, in the recording, it won't make sense if I if I uh, if uh, for people want for people who uh, uh, view the video later on, if uh, if they don't hear the question. Um, so Charles uh, says. Um, I'm curious, as we think about decolonizing, when thinking about Christianity, um, the biblical stories of Jesus suggest Jews were following Jesus to position against Rome. Rome later adopted, co-opted Christianity to further its occupation um, in the Byzantine Empire. Subsequently, Islam rose as another religious tradition that kept the monotheistic God, but further pushed Rome, Europe, out of North Africa and the Middle East. In thinking about this, many of these Jews and Muslims were Blacks fighting a white occupation. Assuming that these faith, faith traditions were primarily Black Africans, would it be plausible to begin to look at race as a motivating factor for movements to the um, colonizing of Islam, Judaism, and Christianity dating from the Roman Empire to modernity? I think I will start uh, actually answering this question. Also, Matthew, Matthew no? uh, Charles, sorry. Charles, very, thank you very, very much for a question that brings very, very important points and possibility of exploration. Uh, I will just say, this is not the work I do, and let me tell you why it's not the work I do. Conception of Africanness, conception of Blackness, uh, are actually mostly, as we understand them today, modern constructions. And as such, I am a little bit uh, concerned about exploring uh, these long-standing patterns uh, with certain kind of a little bit of presentism. Uh, and at the same time, I believe it is important to understand what you point out is about the diversities of Islam and Judaism through history. So I don't do this kind of, I would say, pre-modern uh, conception of the colonization of Jews, uh, both historically and theologically. I will refer to you, as I mentioned before, the work of Susanna Heschel, who has actually taken a little bit this idea of civilization and barbarism I have put and actually present this in terms of colonization of Jews before modernity, which has clearly informed uh, the racializations I am speaking about. So I will say 1492 doesn't start the world. Okay. Uh, and I want to be clear about this, you know, the, the difference is that while um, what we call to the Europe could have any good ideas about anyone else before this date. I will just say that it was for a long time, you know, not Thomas Royal Empire, but a little bit after, a very provincial power. You know, and uh, as uh, I think Michel said, when someone wants to lynch me, is their problem. When someone wants to lynch me, I have the power to do it, becomes my problem. So I think that the issue here is that the construction that later on are going to morph into racialization at different times, intermingled differently. So we, we I just went very quickly through here, uh, but you know the, the work of especially Anya Topolsky in terms of the post 19th century uh, emergence of anti-Semitism and the Judeo-Christian tradition is very important. Uh, but um, what I'm trying to say is that in 1492 start a process of a global dominance where 85% of the lands of the world are going to be occupied by Europeans. 
And this is not just physical power, it's also about epistemology, it's also the way we think. And as such, our European conceptions, we all have it about Africanness, Blackness, what is a Jew, what is a Muslim, what is colonization, what is empire, what is an empire, it actually needs to be understood uh, for me after 1492. That doesn't mean it's a starting point, but it means that having long standing from the empire, from the Roman Empire until later, I think it misses the point. That does not mean that the existence of uh, what we will call today Black Jews, that of course they didn't call themselves Black Jews, they call themselves Jews, uh, for a long time is inequable, is impossible to negate that the uh, appropriation of a particular collective of Jews for global jury is a real problem. And we need to start looking at different paths, at different histories, in order to understand how different trajectories went beyond what today we understand as Jewish normativity. Once that is said, to me, make this long-term construction uh, from the fir first centuries or even before until now, I just think that the terms we are using might need to, uh, might, uh, might benefit for certain kind of historical discussion in order to understand when Africans became Blacks, what Black meant in different places, how Islam and Judaism has been represented at different times in different places. Once we do that, I think that uh, the project of charts is very helpful. But until then, we might uh, create, uh, we can, we can uh, I would say, eclipse more, we can bring more markiness than clarity if we do the thing without these clarifications. Yeah, so um, I pretty much agree with what Santiago is saying over here. I think it's very interesting to also think about the history of what we come to associate with whiteness. And I think historians like Nell Marie Painter, for example, has uh, Nell Irvin Painter, for example, has done such a brilliant, uh, shown us through her brilliant scholarship that so many of these ideas were fragments, incomplete, intersecting, contingent, contextual, relational, all of those things. And with that kind of idea of how do we understand whiteness, we, it, it obviously is a dialect in how we understand blackness. And one of the things that comes to my mind is Othello and the figure of the Moor in Shakespeare. Uh, and at once he is both black and Muslim, but at no point is he explicitly referred to as black and Muslim. And I think as scholars like Nasir Mir have shown, um, Islamophobia is not just about religious bigotry. Islamophobia is also about inscribing certain groups with racial prescriptions. So how does that intersect with what we today uh, see as uh, the colored idea, the colorist ideas of race and racial inscriptions and how do they intersect and how do they diverge? These are, I think, complex histories. And again, I will reiterate what uh, Santiago just said, 1492, as Ramon Grosfigel has shown, is, is, a, is a very interesting point, even in terms of how race eventually comes to be crystallized into what we are seeing in the 20th and 21st century, from Muslims being con constructed as people who worship the false prophet, to indigenous peoples being constructed as people without a soul. So like these, these are complex trajectories, which uh, I think both race is intersectional, but also it is not the only way of uh, analyzing uh, these very complex histories. Thanks. Thanks, thanks for, that, for that answer. I, I hope that response to, to Charles's uh, points and, and questions uh, um, I think this is a good place to end. We're, we're uh, six minutes um, uh, in excess of the allocated time, but thank you so much everyone for, for coming and taking part in, um, in this seminar. Thank you so much to Professor Umar and Professor Slabotsky and, uh, and uh, Dr. Benedicti Koken um, for making this uh, happen and especially to, uh, to, to Kelsey Keeves, who uh, without whom uh, Virtually nothing would uh, would take place, and uh, thank you as well to um, uh, Judaic Studies at um, at the University of Michigan, as well as uh, the Global Islamic Studies Center and the Center for North African and Middle East uh, Middle Eastern Studies. 
And most of all, thank you again to all of you for attending. And uh, I hope to see you uh, soon, virtually or even better in uh, in person one day. I'm still still hoping for that. Have a good day.